Chapter 24, Infectious Diseases and Sepsis. First topic is infectious diseases. Please review the anatomy and physiology in the parts of the body that help defend against infection, such as the immune and the lymphatic system, the blood and the integumentary system, system or the skin. Review the anatomy and physiology of parts of the body that are most susceptible to infection, such as the skin, the respiratory system, and then the GI system. How are diseases spread? Infectious diseases are spread by bacteria, viruses, other microbes like protozoas and fungi and um, parasites. Other microbes may not be communicable. Communicable diseases are with direct contact or contact with secretions. At this time, we're dealing with COVID-19, which is a, vi a virus known as coronavirus. It is highly communicable with contact of secretions. You guys need to understand the distinction between infectious and communicable diseases. By the end of this, you will ha un have a better understanding of the types of microbes and to differentiate between them. Every infectious disease has an incubation period. Every communicable disease has a communicable period. When an infection does cause illness, the time from exposure to the development of the first symptoms is called the incubation period. Depending on how long it takes for it to incubate will determine how long somebody will be symptom free. And it could range from three days to 14 days. The inter, uh, interval when the patient is shedding and releases the releasing the infectious material is the communicable period when the microbe can be potentially transmitted. We have COVID-19 during this course and it is an infectious disease. The symptoms can arrive three to 14 days from exposure. The person, person who has COVID is more likely to shed or release infectious material during the communicable period when they are more with their highest symptoms and likely to transmit it. Factors that influence this infection and spread uh, could be the virulence, which is the amount of um, bacteria or virus in the body. Um, dosing, if there's different medications or different um, routes of the exposure, the route itself, and then your body's resistance, whether it's through passive or active resistance. Review the chapters on the principles of pathophysiology and bleeding and shock. The progression of sepsis to septic shock to the physiological and pathophysiological pathophysi sections as previously discussed. Identification of sepsis is more important, but the criteria is not definitive. You must provide sepsis alerts to ED or clinical staff for potentially septic patients. It is crucial on how to make the determina determination that the alert is necessary. Sepsis is more than just an infection. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition resulting from an abnormal counterproductive response by the body that causes damage to tissues and organs. So it's no longer just an isolated or localized infection. It starts to spread to other areas of the body and become more generalized. The more damage to tissues and organs, the more likely the person is going to develop shock.
The septic shock occurs when the changes result in shock and hypotension that do not respond to IV fluids. You start affecting the, the blood. The person's going to have vasodilation. The pump will be fine. The heart is fine. The amount of fluid is fine with their um, their volume it's the actual dilation of their blood vessels so no matter how much fluid you give them in the IV it's going to continue to seep or leak out and not um, feed the rest of the body here is the diagram for the stages of sepsis basically start with a local injury that becomes infected gets more generalized and becomes a sep uh, systemic problem, also known as sepsis. And then when it starts to affect the person's mentation and it affects other uh, bodily functions, causes this vasodilation, it uh, develops into septic shock. Although there are many locations that you can find sepsis, the big ones are the ones that are going to be related to multiple body systems. So the lungs are related very closely to the respiratory and cardiovascular system. The GI tract has a lot of absorption to and from the bloodstream, as well as to hormones from hormones, our blood sugar levels, our mentation, um, the GI, GU, the GU um, filters out our urine, also determines fluid ratio in our uh, bloodstream. It's able to release or restrict fluid. So these are typically associated with sepsis. Person's not able to urinate. They feel dehydrated or they're hypotensive. The skin is highly associated with sepsis. Normally a break in the skin is where the infection will occur. Um, you have long-term IV catheters in there in the break of the, the skin causing an infection. Um, any sort of tube in the, like puncturing through, or pressure sores are highly susceptible for sepsis. With patient assessment, we're looking at the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS criteria. It is fairly vague, and many patients without sepsis will have two or more of these findings, as in the case of trauma patients, and a number of patients with sepsis will not have two or more of these findings. Uh, the belief here is lower temperature, 96.8, um, the person's unable to create that inflammatory response, unable to maintain their heat with a high-grade fever, more than 101 degrees Fahrenheit, their body is fighting off an intense infection. The idea behind the heart rate over 90 in the systolic blood pressure under 90 is the development of shock. You'll see this in trauma patients as well as other medical patients that are shocky. Um, anytime there is a new onset of altered mental status or worsening mental status, we should be co considering some sort of um, shock, whether it is medical trauma or infection related. Quick re um, sepsis related organ failure assessment resembles the SERS criteria. It does not predict whether someone is septic. It does predict whether a septic patient will have a longer stay at the ICU or likely to die. With patient care, do your full head to toe assessment. Look for signs of an infection. Provide any supportive care. This person is beyond just the minimal care they can get pre-hospital or in the ambulance. The person may have to have a full spectrum antibiotics or even be admitted into the ICU. If a person meets SIRS or very similar criteria, you need to inform the ED of a sepsis alert. Then they can get the appropriate medications as well as getting a room for the ICU.
Think about the different signs and symptoms of a variety of patients with problems. Whether they have shortness of breath and they've had chest pain and an ongoing infection in their leg. Then you can combine other medical issues that we've discussed previously. What are some of the treatment steps? If they're having a blood sugar issue, treat the blood sugar issue to try to rule out that cause of altered level of consciousness. If there's other factors, we can try to relieve some of their symptoms, give them, giving them oxygen, treating them for shock. This topic here, we're gonna cover selected common communicable diseases. Often the communicable diseases can be prevented with standard precaution practices. You need to remember PPE and the appropriate protection for yourself and your partners. When we discuss different communicable diseases, think of times that you, friends, family, patients, coworkers, you've seen with some of these common communicable diseases. Sometimes it helps adult learners grasp the pathophysiology best when they can kind of see what some of the diseases have looked like. Step one with communicable diseases, prevent. Standard precautions, wearing the appropriate PPE, believe that every single person around you has that communicable disease and protect yourself from it. Appropriate vaccinations if one such exists. Assessment, has the patient traveled? A lot of different diseases come from different regions of the planet, different types of environments. Has the patient received recommended rac vaccinations? Have they come from somewhere th the vaccinations don't exist to a country where the vaccinations are recommended? When you encounter patients with a fever, vague symptoms, or an ill-defined complaint, ask them where they have traveled in the pre previous several weeks and if they've received any recommended va vaccinations. You've assessed and now you must care. Under try to understand how the patient feels. You're going to wear your personal protective equipment and get further information, receive preventative prophylactic antibiotics, or get further testing. Chicken pox. It can spread from one to two days after lesions appear and until they dry. Caused by the varicella zoster's virus. Starts with very vague symptoms resembling a cold, followed by fever and rash that itches and looks like blisters. It is very contagious with direct person-to-person -person contact. The dried scabs do not spread disease. If you have somebody with suspected chicken pox, you need to isolate them until their lesions dry. Chicken pox is traditionally a childhood disease, but can return in adults in different form, such as shingles. When it reactivates later in life, this is often in response to a stress. The rash persists for seven to 10 days, but heals within a month. A small but significant number of patients experienced post-herpatic neuralgia. There is a vaccine for the chicken pox. Um, there are antiviral medications that can help shorten the disease and prevent complications. And you can receive the vaccine within three days of the exposure. Measles, also called rubella, is a highly infectious viral disease. It starts with a fever, cough, and eye irritation. They can easily be spread and require standard precautions. Patients at high risk may receive immunoglobulin for protection. These patients can be infants less than one year old, pregnant women, and the immunocompromised individuals. Measles is a reportable disease and increasing number of outbreaks have occurred in recent years among unvaccinated patients. Contact a receiving facility to ensure that they can handle it properly.
It was very easily spread. Inhaled droplets in the air or contact with nose and throat secretions. There was no specified treatment. Prevention is key as we must vaccinate, quarantine, and improve hand hygiene. Mumps caused by the paramyxovirus. Incubation period for mumps is 16 to 18 days. Patients most infectious from two days before the parotid swelling appears to five days afterwards. Starts with very vague symptoms such as muscle aches, loss of appetite, and a headache. Progresses to swelling and inflammation of both parotids. And these parotids can last seven to 10 days. Treatment of mumps is supported with no specific post-exposure um, actions. Approximately a quarter of adult males who get mumps get orchitis. Steril sterility has resulted in a few cases, but is rare. Refer to your reproductive anatomy and physiology. Transmissions through droplet per and you require droplet precautions when dealing with patients. Contact with direct saliva is the means of transmission. Vaccination and quarantine of patients for five days after swelling appears. Hepatitis A is one of several types of hepatitis and starts suddenly in adults. Hepatitis is a general term that means inflammation of the liver. Liver being hepa, itis being inflammation. Signs and symptoms of hepatitis A, fever, nausea, lack lack of appetite, malaise, abdominal pain, jaundice. Jaundice is key with any inflammations of the liver. It's generally worse in older patients. Here is a picture of jaundice in the sclera. Doesn't matter race, culture, ethnicity, skin tone, tan lines, the sclera will appear yellow or jaundice with liver disease or inflammations. Hepatitis A is spread by fecal to oral route. There is no specific treatment. Prevention is hand hygiene, proper food preparation, and vaccinations. Commonly, this is parents with children in diapers. It may spread easily when people crowd around together, especially from daycares and schools, especially under unplanned circumstances. Hepatitis E is spread through the same route, but is caused by a different virus. Hepatitis B is very different from Hepatitis A. It is a more serious disease with sometimes life-threatening consequences. Before development of a vaccine and changes in injection practices, hundreds of healthcare workers, including EMS providers, died every year in the United States from occupationally acquired hepatitis B. Infection with hepatitis B is very common in many parts of the world. Signs and symptoms include nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, vague abdominal pain, jaundice, and younger patients have fewer or no symptoms but are much more, more likely to develop the chronic infection. Transmission is from blood or any fluid that contains blood. Semen, cerebrospinal fluid, amniotic fluid, vaginal secretions, and any other fluid. This could be from blood transfusions, shared needles during drug injection, sexual intercourse, close household contacts, reuse of lancets for glu glucose testing, and childbirth. HPV is very hardy and can survive for a week on services outside the body. It can actually survive once dried. If it's reconstituted into a liquid, it becomes active again. There's no specific treatment. The only thing that we can really do is prevent. We have a vaccine and we have proper decontamination of equipment after a call. We've also required safety needles as well as needleless IV systems.
The efficacy of antiviral medications that are administered in some countries is unclear. Hepatitis D can only occur in patients that have hepatitis B. It has very similar signs and symptoms, but is more sudden onset and has a shorter two to eight week incubation period. There is no vaccine for hepatitis D, but if you are immune against hepatitis B, you cannot be infected with hepatitis D. There is a treatment, but it is administered over the course of almost a year. Hepatitis C is very similar to hepatitis B in many ways. Still have the nausea, the vomiting, the lack of appetite, and the vague abdominal pain. Jaundice is less common in patients with hepatitis C. Approximately less than three quarters are infected without showing any symptoms. Transmission is through bloodborne through shared needles, less commonly through sexual intercourse or even childbirth. Birth. Several face, face bleh, safe medication regimens, but no vaccine at this time. Prevention is standard precaution and proper use and disposal of sharps. HIV AIDS. AIDS is still one of the few diseases for which people experience discrimination, but treatments that have reduced the level of infectivity have made tremendous differences in the length and quality of life. Signs and symptoms for some patients are flu-like symptoms within a few weeks of the HIV infection, maybe a fever, sore throat, or fatigue. A person can have HIV for many years before they develop into AIDS. The AIDS characteristics are due, by, due um, when there's opportunistic infections. These sarcoma lesions is indicative of AIDS from an HIV patient. Routes of transmission, shared needles, unprotected unprotected sex between men. Men and women can both get um, HIV from unprotected sex, any penetrating activity that in involves blood and semen, during delivery or breastfeeding from mother to newborn. Antiviral medications reduce and suppress the HIV viral load, but it does not remove. There are preventions which are standard precautions and public measures to reduce shared needle use and promote condom use. Following significant exposure to blood and other bodily fluids, wash the area and consult a healthcare provider if you are exposed. The virus um, in HIV is very weak. It does not last outside the body for very long. Panic about HIV persists in some areas. To help reduce the fear about HIV and AIDS, the EMT may explain simple precautions to prevent HIV infection. Treat all patients with respect and courtesy. Why do you think there is a lingering stigma against a patient with AIDS? What can you do as an EMT to reduce that stigma? Influenza is a common viral illness that tends to occur at certain times of the year, but can occur at any time. It is caused by more than two dozen viruses. The H1N1 essentially is a, how they document a certain type of virus. If you think of H as like a hand, so it grabs on to a cell, it will copy it. It'll copy DNA or copy RNA to duplicate more versions of itself. So an H1 attaches to these receptors and has a hand and holds on to it. The N1, so think of the N being a nip or a cut, like you, you cut it. So the hand grabs, it copies, and then things get cut. So H1N1. Um, there is actually H1 all the way up to N32. 
Some of them do not cause human illnesses. Some of them are from different animals or only affect different animals. A significant amount of our illnesses and viruses come from animals and have transferred over to human. Uh, the belief, belief behind measles is that it came from dogs. Um, there are multiple different bird flus. The flus, the, the birds have a sickness and a flu and eventually it gets into uh, the human world and starts to develop and mutate. It is a very common viral illness. Signs and symptoms include fever, and usually a non-productive cough, a dry cough, severe muscle aches, sore throat, headache, and severe weakness and fatigue. Childhood influenza showing very signs of fever here. You can also have these signs and symptoms last for two weeks at a time. Um, body aches upon body aches. Um, eyebrows. I've had people describe pain behind their eyeballs. Influenza is spread by droplets or direct contact. There are some antiviral medications that lessen the severity and shorten the entire length of the infection, but must be taken within 48 hours of the first symptom onset. Prevention is key. Hand hygiene, wearing masks, and a vaccination. When the CDC identifies a new strain of influenza, it is recommended that healthcare providers take respiratory precautions, which includes N95 masks, until droplet um, precautions can be confirmed to be sufficient. To date, standard surgical masks are sufficient for all forms of influenza. The populations more prone to influenza are the very young, the elderly, and patients with chronic conditions. Croup, also known as laryngotracheobronchitis, caused by the human parainfluenza virus. Signs and symptoms, inflammation and swelling of the larynx, trachea, bronchi, typically children between six months and three years, they're going to be the most susceptible. Symptoms often worse at night. Despite the resemblance in the names, the parainfluenza and influenza are completely separate organisms and com have completely separate signs and symptoms. So do not confuse this with the flu. Transmission by droplets from coughs or sneezes that survive on objects. Prevention would be hand hygiene and refrain from touching nose, mouth, and eyes. Treatment for croup is symptomatic. There really is no um, vaccine. So basically you treat whatever the symptoms are. Pertussis or whooping cough. Bacterial uh, infection of the respiratory system caused by the Bordetella pertussis bacteria. Begins like a typical upper respiratory infection, worsens into un uninterrupted coughing follow up, followed by a whooping sound on inspiration. Diagnosis involves pertussis cough. Sorry, diagnosis involves of pertussis in, of pertussis involves a cough for at least two weeks plus at least one of these coughing paroxysms, which is inspiratory whooping, and or post tussive vomiting. It's spread by large droplets in the air, treated with antibiotics since it is a bacteria. There is a prevention with a vaccine. The best prevention is going to be hand hygiene and refrain from touching nose, mouth, and eyes. Pneumonia is the result of an, of an infection by any one of the very number of microbes. This section focuses on the pneumococcal pneumonia, one of the types an EMT is more likely to see and which is caused by a bacterium streptococcus pneumoniae. Signs and symptoms are fever, chills, shortness of breath, tachypnea, pleuritic pain, so their lungs are actually kind of rubbing um, and causing the pain, so not necessarily pain in the lungs, 
but pain on the outside of the lungs or how they're touching the rest of the tissue. Normally they'll have a productive cough. They'll have um, uh, inflammation in their x-ray. Um, if you do follow them into a clinic and see an x-ray. Uh, there is potential to have febrile seizures in young children and infants. And you're going to see altered mental status as a common sign in your elderly. If you suspect a patient has pneumonia, how does this, how does this affect your approach to their ABCs? This x-ray shows inflammation of the lung. Note the area in the lower right lung that appears cloudy. This is where the pneumonia is located. All that gunk and gooky stuff, all that snot that needs to come out when they cough. So they're going to have a productive cough, and if they don't, they need to get that stuff out. They need to have a productive cough. Pneumonia spread by droplets usually requires close contact over several days. Although there is many different causes, including viral, the most common cause of, of sepsis in patients at extreme ages with compromised immune system is going to be pneumonia. Prevention is hand hygiene, cough etiquette, coughing into your armpit, and the pneumonia vaccine. Tuberculosis, also known as TB or latent TB, is common in people who are exposed and means that they have an infection but no symptoms. Caused by the bacterium, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Signs and symptoms, cough. Initially it'll be dry, later productive, and then purulent sputum, which uh, think of it as like thick, almost pus. Um, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Not a good diet plan. Don't get TB to lose weight. It's spread by coughing, singing, sneezing. Any time that you are going to have droplets coming out of your lungs and into the air. It is treated with antibiotics. It's prevented with a vaccine. Um, but they must have a high index of suspicion, airborne disease precautions, including N95. Most of the time, EMTs get a post exposure um, TB test. TB is more common in settings where people with poor health are gathered. Patients with HIV are at a higher risk. Meningitis. Inflammation of the meninges caused by the bacterium Neisseria meningitidis. Meningitis is an infl inflammation of the meninges the membranes that surround the brain and the spinal cord. It's that fluid that kind of protects the brain and spinal cord. There are a number of causes of the condition, but this section will focus on the meningococcal meningitis. Meningitis has a number of potential complications, including shock, multiple organ failure, blood clotting problems, brain damage, deafness, and loss of one or more limbs. Signs and symptoms, abrupt onset of fever, nausea, vomiting, severe headache, nuchal rigidity, which is your neck, photophobia or sensitivity of light, and possible petechiae, or like red raised bumps on the skin. Here's a petechial rash associated with the meningitis. Meningitis is spread by direct con contact treated with antibiotics for the meningococcal meningitis and can be prevented by a vaccination. If the meningitis is caused by a virus, then it can be treated with antivirals. There's also parasitic meningitis, um, which I don't know nearly as much about. Basically, I hear it from watching too much monsters inside me. I do have a case about a meningitis patient that I had. Her son called us in a panic saying that his mother was acting bizarre. We arrive on scene and she is sitting on an upside down honey bucket. So the bottom of the bucket is facing up and she is sitting on it and she is defecating on top of the bucket.
Um, when she looks at us, she doesn't actually look at us. She kind of looks through us. Um, she jumps up and starts to run toward us. We do protect ourselves and move out of the way. The son states that she's not supposed to be up and walking, that she has two broken ankles that she's supposed to be keeping off her feet. Um, it's not a whole lot we can do. She jumped up and ran at us. We did finally convince her to sit down, and I say that loosely. Um, without restraining her, we were able to keep her into a chair until we got more hands available to assist us. She had been eating dirt in the plants and trying to eat the phone, and that's why the son called 911. When we got there, she had eaten more than just dirt. She had actually eaten some of her feces. Uh, it was indicated in between her teeth and smelled it on her breath. The only way I could keep her calm was to sit next to her in the back of the ambulance and try to keep her from biting me. Um, once we transported her to the hospital, um, we decontaminated our ambulance and went out for the rest of the day. When we got back to the station, our chief called us in the morning and said that we had to return to the hospital to get prophylactics. Uh, the patient was diagnosed with bacterial meningitis and she ended up dying from the bacterial meningitis. Bacterial meningitis is highly more fatal than viral meningitis and there have been um, more complications due to the bacterial meningitis where they've had to actually amputate limbs um, from the disease. STIs, no longer calling them STDs. Um, look into different causes and reasons that there are different STIs um, between viral and bacterial. Get, see more of these and kind of do your own research in the back um, beyond this presentation. STIs include viral STIs and bacterial STIs. Prevention, condoms, vaccination, safe sex. STIs are not as common STA is not a common reason for patients to access 911. Most of the time they can go to a primary care or a um, health care area. Uh, emergency services will have women call who develop pelvic inflammatory disease, most commonly caused by gonorrhea or chlamydia. It causes severe low abdominal pain that may or may not be associated with an increased vaginal discharge. Diseased carry, diseases carried by ticks. Other diseases such as Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever are carried by ticks. If you live or work in an area with ticks, consider becoming familiar with these diseases as they're more common in your area. There are ticks in Alaska, they're just rare. They're not um, as widespread as other places in Lower 48. Tick bites transmit Lyme disease. Uh, with Lyme disease, most patients display a rash, um, erythema migrans within a week that looks like a bullseye. Uh, it's treated with antibiotics. Prevention in backcountry rescue in wooded areas is to cover your arms and legs, wear high socks, check frequently for ticks, remove ticks with tweezers. Emerging and newly recognized infectious disease. In some cases, antibiotics that used to be effective no longer work. It's a result of bacteria developing resistance. Patients may get infectious infections that are no longer treatable, and patients may die from diseases that were easily cured only a few years ago. Use standard precautions to protect yourself, your coworkers, and your patients. Increasing bacterial resistance has led to several conditions the EMTs deal with on the regular, including methylen resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, vancomycin resistant Enterococcus, VRE, and Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, a less common but still important example of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. As bacteria evolve, the list of these resistant diseases will grow.
recently emerged or newly discovered diseases, HIV and AIDS, severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, and that is what COVID-19 is. It's a COVID SARS-19. Um, that one's more newly discovered. Uh, the Ebola, devir Ebola virus disease a few years ago had a rampant scare in the lower 48. Um, Middle East respiratory syndrome um, and Zika virus, which is transmitted via mosquito and affects um, the fetus during gestation in pregnant women. Emerging and newly recognized infectious diseases, when the outbreak occurs, you gotta remain calm. Do not go and buy all of the toilet paper. Understand that news reports may exaggerate the extent of the number of ill or the ease with which the disease is spread. Follow the recommendations of the CDC and your local health department. Report of outbreaks led to panic or near panic the CDC and WHO and other national and international agencies worked diligently to discover the microbes that cause disease. They worked to find effective treatment for them and how to prevent their spread. This information is disseminated to healthcare providers and institutions so that it can be implemented. Healthcare workers um, implement the appropriate steps and significantly the re reduce the number of people who become infected and ill. Do not panic and bum rush the hospitals. Stay calm. If you, were, if you were watching the news and saw a story about an outbreak on a new communicable disease in a nearby city, what would you do as an EMT responder? A lot of us are dealing right now with being in COVID isolation. That's why we're taking an online EMT course. In summation, Sepsis is a life-threatening condition resulting from abnormal, counterproductive response of the body. Our body needs to keep fluid, but instead, counterproductive, it ends up leaking all of the fluid out, leaching it through our leaky capillaries. It's unable to sustain that um, good form in our blood vessels, and the person becomes hypotensive and shocky. Common sources of infections would be the pulmonary system, GIGU, and the central nervous system. SERS criteria is very vague, um, as some trauma patients will fit this criteria, as well as some septic patients won't fit this criteria. Use your best judgment to determine if this person fits any of this criteria and call the hospital or clinic ahead so they can prepare. In the septic patient who does not need to be resuscitated, the most important thing you can do is notify the receiving hosp hospital of a sepsis alert. The most important and effective ways to avoid getting an infectious disease is using standard precautions, getting the appropriate vaccinations, and washing your hands and keeping your hands off of your face, face and mouth. When new or newly discovered infectious disease outbreaks occur, follow the advice of the CDC and the prevention and the local health department. Know your personal protective equipment that you need, how to use it, how to disinfect it, or how to get rid of it. What is the SERS criteria? covered it before, it is very vague. What body systems are the most common sources of this sepsis? What's the difference between the incubation period and the period in which a disease is transmissible? Have you, have you had the vaccinations you need to keep, to take care of patients without getting yourself sick? What are the differences in transmission routes and symptoms from hepatitis A, B, and C? What are the symptoms of meningococcal meningitis? What is unusual about that rash? Get the appropriate vaccination and always use standard precautions, include, including appropriate use of disposable gloves, eyewear, face protection, and respiratory protection.
when assessing patients with an infectious disease, remember to ask them if they have traveled recently and if they got the recommended vaccinations. Also remember to be empathetic and respond appropriately to how the patient feels. A cough like a seal barking is characteristic of croup, which tends to get worse at night. Although the volume and nature of the cough is alarming, you should reassure the parents that the cough isn't as bad as it sounds. Taking standard precautions provides supportive treatment. Assess the child for shortness of breath. Remember that ALS providers may, may be able to nebulize epinephrine, which may reduce the swelling, and they may be able to administer a steroid, which will further reduce the swelling. Very few patients with croup have inflammation and swelling in their airways where they need to be admitted to the hospital. So look for signs of hypoxia just in case.